So on a little scrap of paper, put your name and the date. And uh, if I want you to answer a question on your half sheet, I'll, I'll formally state it. Okay. So usually how a lecture goes is I have my PowerPoint and uh, I'll give board notes. And um, that's kind of my style. Again, the most important thing in terms of preparing for your test is what's presented in lecture. Okay. Your lecture notes are your study guide. So the endocrine system, here's a picture of kind of the physiology of it. Let me kind of like put that picture into word form. Uh, so what you see there is endocrine glands. They synthesize these chemical messengers called hormones. which are secreted into the bloodstream. Hormones travel in the bloodstream to specific target organs. Last sentence, the hormone elicits some response from the target organ. Now that's a long-winded way of explaining this picture. Now the key thing I would highlight, uh, first in endocrine glands. Well, they don't show the whole gland, they show a cell secreting these gray balls into the blood vessel. Okay, so that will be the circulating hormone. So that, that's the other thing that we're gonna spend time talking about, all the different chemical messengers, that hormone, and that when secreted into the bloodstream, they can travel anywhere in the body because blood goes everywhere. Now it turns out that they target specific things. They only can bind to their receptor on cells that present it. And they could be close, they could be far away. All right, so this is distance. So that's basically it in a nutshell. And, um, so your, your challenge is to study all of the glands, what are their secretions, and what's the physiology, what's the response that they elicit. And that's kind of how you study the endocrine system. This is the other major communicating system of the body. Okay, when you come out at 4.30, most instructors end with the nervous system. The nervous system, you kind of learn about the synapse, which is a connection between two cells and you learn how neurons can communicate with other neurons or, or muscle fibers. Here, 
this cell is communicating with these cells, not through a synapse, but using the bloodstream in this chemical messenger. Not a neurotransmitter, right, but a hormone. So this is the other major communication system in the body. So think of them as long distance chemical signals. And to start off with an example, um, I like to use blood sugar. All right, so um, one of the mechanisms for hormones is to maintain some balance. For example, blood sugar at about less than 100 mg per deciliter. Okay, so there's some, some number of uh, where blood sugar is uh, regulated at. So the imbalance can go both ways. Blood sugar can go too high or too low. And so let's do the example of how the endocrine system works in the example of high blood glucose. So let's say you... Um, Example, eat pasta. That'll raise the blood sugar, okay? Your digestive system will break it down and you'll absorb it into the intestinal capillaries. So in, in your mind, let's, let's visualize blood vessels And let's pretend that glucose are these little blue circles there. They get absorbed into the intestine and in your bloodstream. The body needs a mechanism to take that energy, the glucose, and get it to the cells to burn for metabolism or to store it for stored energy. And so that level of glucose being elevated in the blood, it can be detected by the pancreas. Now the pancreas is a gland, and so they just show it as a gland. It doesn't look like much by itself. It's behind the stomach. That's where it is anatomically. I'll show you that later. But the pancreas can detect that homeostatic imbalance. So here's pancreas. So it basically has a mechanism to detect changes in blood glucose. And what it will do in response is to secrete the hormone insulin. Now insulin, let's say I illustrate it with um, green balls. Insulin will enter the bloodstream along with the glucose. So it's like they're circulating together. insulin with the glucose. Now what insulin can do, it can um, stimulate insulin sensitive tissues. Now in the, in the flow chart there, they, they got tissue cells, they got liver, uh, hmm, I would say skeletal muscle is a big one. So let's go skeletal muscle and liver. Those are the two principal targets of the hormone insulin. Okay. Strong muscle. And here's liver. I mean, the way I drew it is similar to the pancreas, but basically the liver is the largest solid organ in the body. And skeletal muscle, your body is about 80% muscle, there's a lot of it. I mean, these are the organs that can utilize the glucose. You can store it in the liver, and the muscle can use it for energy. And so the goal is you got to get the glucose out of the blood and into these organs. And so um, you know, you'll pretend that there are um, cells within these organs that present an insulin receptor. On the cell surface in this example. Okay, so that is my insulin receptor.
And so what happens is, if insulin is secreted in high enough amounts, because of the raised blood sugar, what, what'll happen is insulin will bind its receptor. That'll trigger an intracellular response. Well, the end result is there will be glucose transporters as a result of insulin binding its receptor that'll um, kind of like take glucose up into the cell. So imagine a little vesicle that can kind of like <clears throat> go to the cell surface. And in the end, you'll get glucose into the cell so the cell can use it. And by taking it out of the blood, you're gonna lower the blood glucose. So that's kind of the end result. When the cell gets it, the end result is decreased blood glucose. Now there's one detail on there that I would like to note. And it's for the liver. One of the things you can do, if you're not gonna burn the glucose, you're gonna store it, is you convert glucose to glycogen. So glucose is a monomer. Um, so imagine if you have glycogen, which is a chain of glucose molecules in your liver. I'm just kind of drawing some random chains of glucose here. There's some definite structure. The point is that glucose is a monomer. Glycogen is a polymer. So on the figure, when it says convert glucose to glycogen, it's simply taking the monomer and then just sticking it on your polymer. Okay, you're storing it, or you're burning it directly for metabolism. Maybe the muscle does that. But you can have glycogen in your liver and the skeletal muscle. Those are your two prime sources for glycogen storage in physiology. physiology is, okay, let's kind of take notes here. That paragraph you wrote, the first thing we said was, what was the endocrine gland? Okay, so for us, for this example, it was the pancreas. And then we said you secrete a hormone into the bloodstream. That was insulin. And then thirdly, well, what was the target? Target organs. When we did that, that was the, you know, check, check. Skeletal muscle and liver. And, well, it, it elicits some response. I'm going to put that as a number four. response. Well, that's kind of what I described here. You lower, you, I described this, and the end result is you, you lower the blood glucose. And so that's kind of the pattern of how, of how you should study anything and everything endocrine for this chapter for your test next week, Wednesday. And so um, what I want to do on, on your half sheet, I did one imbalance. Talk it over with your neighbor. This isn't a quiz. You can go solo if you want. I want you to do the imbalance where glucose goes down and what's the response. So go ahead and take a minute and do that now. And an basically answer just one, two, three, four. Okay. Any questions? Just do the imbalance. Blood glucose gets too low. Fill out the one, two, three, four. I won't go over the right answer. I would just like to see what you put. I grade it later in my office. Again, these are worth two points. I'm just kind of going for 
you're within the ballpark. Okay, there's something technically wrong, but it's in the ballpark. I won't deduct points. Now, this first example, you can kind of see how my lecture style is. I just kind of, I'm kind of train of thought. I just kind of go with what's in my mind and I get it up here. And it may seem like it's all over the place. This is where the YouTube can help. And this is um, my number one study tip in addition to what I already mentioned. You should do your first review of notes right after class. So if you take notes on something like this, maybe you still remember what was going on. Okay, so let me even write that on the board. You do your first review right after class. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Do we have class? No. no. Do your second review tomorrow on the off day. Usually what I did I would ride my bike from the lecture hall to the library. I went to Davis, so I would ride a bike. And I would literally rewrite all of my notes because it was like chicken scratch like the first time when I took notes. It looked like this kind of. But I would rewrite it much neater. And I couldn't believe, the thing I noticed was, which I was astonished with, I remembered everything. And research shows this, and this is what I teach at the Science Success Center. Um, I'm a tutor over there. We always teach students to do your review right after class before you forget it. If you wait to do your first review tomorrow, you forget about 80%. That's, that's what it says. And so you go back and look at this tomorrow when you've forgotten 80% of it, it's not going to help you much. So this is my number one study tip. Do your first two reviews after class and tomorrow. And I think you'll see a big difference in your retention. Okay. Well, anyways, I'll, I'll kind of grade that later. I'm going to move on. I'm going to erase the board here. Now the word endocrine 
is often used in the endocrine chapter, but I'm at least going to give you some context. It's a gland, but there's also exocrine glands. And when you come across those two terms, understand that this chapter is the endocrine glands. And this is kind of how we can compare and contrast and know exo uh, in terms of secretion. Any gland that has an exocrine function, you're basically using a duct and your secretion is being secreted kind of outside the body or inside the digestive tract. That's usually what you'll see in AMP. So when I say non-hormones, that's usually like saliva, tears, that's a secretion, you know, um, mucus. When we get to digestive, there's a lot of enzymes. Enzymes are not hormones, they're, they're enzymes. I'll teach you those when we get to digestion. And they're secreted outside the body, so you need a duct to get it there. They have ducts. Passageway. Okay. And you usually secrete it, say, for example, you know, on skin or inside the GI tract, your digestive tract. Those are the commonest examples of a gland secreting something onto these locations, exocrine, outside the body. If it's inside the digestive tract, technically it's outside your body because it could possibly pass right through you with never having been absorbed. Okay, endocrine, which, which is, is what we're talking about, that always means hormones. Hormones can either be steroids or proteins. Now, I'll go over the, the chemical form of what a steroid is and what a protein is later. It does bear importance on the target cells. Well, anyways, they don't need a duct because they're secreted right into the bloodstream. They just need access to some capillary bed. So for that reason, we say they're ductless. Endocrine glands have access to capillaries. So capillaries are present somewhere. So here's a, a picture of that. If it's a gland that's in exocrine function, you can see the duct, right, leading to the surface. And if it's endocrine, you can see the, the little capillaries, the bloodstream passing through, and the hormones are secreted right into the bloodstream. Now, as we go through all the endocrine glands, um, I'll start doing that today. I'll start with the pituitary. For the histology quiz on Friday, we have to become familiar with what these glands look like under the microscope. And this, maybe this doesn't make sense to you now, but I'll present all the histology you need to know, probably on, not, not probably, I will do it on Wednesday. My strategy is, uh, under that blue tarp there is a microscope with a camera on it. And the camera is hooked up to here so you can see what I see. And that way I can take you through all the slides and since it has a camera, I can like take a picture of it. And I can even make those pictures available to you. And those are the pictures I'll use for your first quiz, which is when? Friday. Friday. Okay, so that's kind of my strategy for endocrine histology, but I won't be able to teach this until Wednesday. Just keep in mind that's my approach. Because before I do that, I would like to talk more about hormones. And, uh, there's some general things that your book does a good job outlining, and I would like to make sure it's covered here in lecture. And we call it factors affecting target cell specificity. Factors affecting target cell specificity.
Now, um, appreciate that if you're a hormone in the bloodstream, the blood is contained in the blood vessels. That makes it its own fluid compartment. There's fluid outside the capillaries. That's another fluid compartment. There are fluids contained within the cell membrane of all the cells. That's a third fluid compartment. You can even consider lymphatics as a fourth fluid compartment. But anyways, the point of telling you of all these compartments is um, things have to diffuse from one compartment through another to get to the target cell. That's kind of why you want to be aware of it. And one of the things that can affect target cell specificity, basically we were saying, was enough hormone secreted to trigger a response. That's the first thing that could affect if the cell will respond. Hormone concentration. So I'll just put hormone and I'll put my chemistry concentration brackets around it, right? You remember that? Concentration is inferred by those brackets. Now, it, it turns out hormones are very sensitive. You don't have to secrete very much for them to have a physiological response in the body. About 10 to the negative 9 and 10 to the negative 12 molarity. So that's very low. But still, as my PowerPoint illustrates, you, you need enough hormone, this amount, to elicit response. So one factor is concentration. Was enough hormone secreted? Question. Another thing that could affect it is, well, the hormones receptors. So on the slide there, oops. well, I'll title it either the upregulation or downregulation of receptors. So up or down. Regulation of receptors. I have the hormone illustrated as a green square, but I, I simply have the hormone's receptor as a shape that fits that square. So here's the hormone. So this is the hormone receptor. I think it's obvious that that shape fits in there. But anyways, the point is, do you have enough receptors by the target cell uh, being regulated? That, that'll determine if you get a response or not. Now, now note the slide, okay? There's some details here. You'll up, the cell will upregulate the hormone levels in response to rising levels of the hormone. Okay, it's like it's priming itself to respond to what's coming. Now, if the hormone level remains persistently high, you don't want to overshoot homeostasis, so you'll downregulate in, in response to persistently high levels of hormone. So that'll kind of determine the up or down regulation of the hormones there. So that, that affects whether or not you get a response. And the third thing is a mistaken transcription translation protein synthesis. It should be a high affinity fit. So we'll call number three, affinity. High is desirable. High, that's what you want. Because that tight fit will trigger the intracellular molecular biology, okay? So I'll say high affinity. That triggers response, that's desirable. Um, low affinity, maybe there's a mutation. Obviously, that I illustrated that it doesn't fit. It's, you could have the receptor there in some kind of mutated form. It's not going to fit the hormone. It's not going. You're not going to get a response. So that's why that's important. And um, the other thing to consider is if the protein, if the hormone is a protein or a steroid.
Okay, so proteins. The building blocks, the monomers of proteins are amino acids. And you can see the general structure of an amino acid here. Okay. You have a carbon, and it's surrounded by four positions, um, hydrogen, some functional group indicated by generic R, a carboxylic acid, or an amine group. Okay, well anyways, that's the basic structure of an amino acid. I think the main thing for this class is to understand, for this test I should say, is to understand that Protein hormones are water soluble, they're not lipid soluble. Because they're water soluble, in other words, they're not lipid soluble, they can't get past the cell membrane. So that means that if you're going to elicit a response, that you must have your receptor presented on the cell membrane. Here's the target cell. Here's the nucleus. You must present the hormone's receptor on the cell surface. Because the hormone cannot make it past the hydrophobic zone of that lipid bilayer, the cell membrane. Okay, so that's the main thing to take away from a hormone. Being a protein, uh, the other thing is, uh, what if you're a steroid? Steroid hormones have that four ring, ring structure shape. More or less this. Oops. Now this tight configuration uh, is considered a lipid. Steroids are classified as lipids. And so like dissolves like, steroid hormones can actually diffuse right through the cell membrane because they're lipid soluble. So they are lipid soluble. In terms of uh, when the cell puts the uh, hormone receptor, it doesn't have to put it on the cell surface. It could put it inside the cytoplasm. It could put it inside the nuclear membrane, call it a nuclear receptor. Okay, the point is that um, in this mechanism here, steroid hormones, they tend to turn on genes directly because of their ability to, to bind their receptors inside the cell. They can turn gene on, genes on, and they call that direct gene activation for this mechanism here. So associate direct gene activation for steroid hormones, for their mechanism to do the physiology. For protein hormones, they, they need to use molecular biology. When they bind, they may trigger an intracellular response that has many steps. And so what, what I'll teach you are, are the G proteins. So associate the G protein pathways with proteins and direct gene activation for the A. Well, I wanted to give you a couple examples of um, steroid hormones. The sex hormones are steroid hormones. Testosterone is the male king androgen. That's why they put a little crown there. And estrogen, the, the structures are that basic four ring design. Um, they're derived from cholesterol. That's one thing you should know. All steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Put that as a side note. I want to move on. There's um, another 
category that may be considered hormones, those are called eicosanoids, but I won't have you be responsible for them. So you may ignore that for your test. If you want to read about them, go ahead. But just note to yourself, this slide, not responsible for it. I'll stick to the hormones that are proteins and steroids. And so I want to show you how they can be triggers. On this slide, I know I have the, uh, on the board, um, not the same order, but I have a picture of a receptor inside the nucleus and the hormone is, is a steroid going right to it. That mechanism is direct gene activation, right? If you have to trigger an intracellular response because you're presented on the outside of the cell, those are protein hormones. Okay, so here are the pictures from your book. For this is for um, direct gene activation. Let, let me walk you through the steps here. Let me clear the board first. Okay, so the first step, they show, well, let me see, you're probably already looking at it already. Okay, what color is the steroid hormone on this figure? Yellow. It is yellow. I don't know if you guys saw it. Let me point it out in case you're looking for it. It's way up there. And the first step says it diffuses through the cell membrane and binds its receptor in the cytoplasm. Okay, so I guess if you're numbering the steps for direct gene activation, that would be step one. inside the target cell there. So step two, that that receptor hormone complex, it enters the nuke and it turns genes on. Receptor hormone complex enters nucleus. And then thirdly, well, when you bind um, a specific DNA sequence, well, you're going to turn genes on. So that's the third step. I'll just say bind response element. So now you're on the DNA. Bind response element on DNA, on your genes. You're turning the gene on. This is biological activity. And then so, you know, you initiate the whole transcription and then translation. So for number four, they say transcription gets the mRNA. You're transcribing the gene. The product is a messenger RNA. And then the protein synthesis can occur in step five. And you translate that mRNA transcript. So transcription, what I'm writing is translation after that for step five. And that'll get you protein. So I'll just say protein. Your newly synthesized protein. Now it doesn't really tell you, you know, which, which one it is. It's just, it's just a generic example. But that, that's basically the, uh, the steps. Uh, whereas if the cell has to kind of like present the receptor on the surface, well, it's kind of a, a different set of steps. So this is G proteins. So for the first step, that's what I'm way up here. They're showing the hormone binding its receptor on the surface. And they call the hormone the first messenger because typically they call things like G protein pathways second messenger systems.
So, one hormone binds receptor on cell surface. That's the first step. Okay, and that'll activate um, a G protein. Well, that says that for step two. You can see that. Let me write it here. Activate G protein. Now, we're not giving you details here, but I should at least mention there are subunits on G proteins that get activated and cause it to move along with the inside of the cell surface. There's like alpha, there's beta. You don't need to know that level of detail. But notice it is moving when it's activated with this GDP. So what it does is it will then activate an adenylate cyclase. Oops, cat keeps coming on, sorry. Okay. So the G protein, now activated, will in turn activate adenylate cyclase. And that process will then get you your second messenger. Adenylate cyclase, it converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Adenylate cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. If you had a fun summer and you can't even remember what ATP is, it's just three phosphates. You cleave off the last two to get one phosphate, you get cyclic AMP. The M is for mono. Okay, that's all you're doing. Now, this is your second messenger. There are other things that act as second messengers. Cyclic AMP is one, calcium is another. Calcium can also act as, in some examples, a second messenger. Okay, but the point is that in this example here, let's say it's a cyclic AMP that will activate kinases that act that trigger cell responses. And well, once you get to this step, the cell can respond. Okay, so they kind of use the analogy of handing a baton in a relay race. Um, I, I like the analogy for this one. The analogy goes. Um, you're going, I'm going for a stroll at night, and I see my neighbor's house is on fire, okay? So I go pound on the door, but I can only manage to wake up a small child. So the small child is taught not to open the door to strangers. So I'm shouting at the child through the door, your house is on fire, let me in so I can help, but the child doesn't. So I say, okay, well, well go wake up your parents, so they can call 911. Okay, so the child then goes, and does all that. So in my analogy, what am I? Pounding on the door. I'm the first messenger. I'm the hormone. I'm trying to get in the cell, in the house, but can I? No. no, the hormones never enter the cell. And that is a mistake on the first exam I see. You talk about hormones that are proteins entering the cell. They never do. They act through second messengers. So. In my example, who might the child be in my example? Maybe a G protein, okay? But the point is, if the child goes, wakes up the parents, maybe the parents, in my analogy, generate the, the cyclic AMP you know, to get the ball rolling. But the point of that analogy is to illustrate the students that protein hormones do not enter the cell. Okay, that's an important point to remember. Um, you guys have been sitting a while, let's go ahead and take a break. And let me kind of tell you the procedures for how I do breaks. 
I like to take a break too, which means I have to have the room empty. So I'll, I'll ask all students to leave. Um, take what, whatever you want with you. The door is locked, so things should be safe in here. And uh, I typically break for about 15 minutes. So let's come back at 9.45. See you next.